Welcome. My name is Paul Wallace. I'm a capital markets writer at The Banker, and I'm here talking to Emil Petrov, head of capital solutions at Nomura. Emil, welcome. Hello. Emil, in the last year, we've seen uh, the emergence of so-called COCO deals, contingent convertible um, bonds from banks. And also, um, in, uh, in the last two weeks, we saw a $1.5 billion additional tier one or 81 uh, deal from Spanish bank BBVA. Firstly, what are the differences between uh, COCOs and 81s? And what is the reason that European banks are um, seemingly looking to issue more of them? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, 81 stands for additional tier one. Uh, it's a type of bank capital instrument that is strictly defined in the regulations. Uh, and it needs to have, among other features, uh, principal loss absorption on a going concern basis. So it needs to be able to absorb losses when a bank goes into difficulty, but presumably before the bank bec becomes non-viable. Uh, COCOs is a more generic term, which, which is merely an abbreviation of contingent convertibles, but the market uses it very loosely to describe all forms of contingent loss absorption. So you can say that additional tier one is a form of COCO. Now the next thing uh, is the trigger that triggers the loss absorption. And um, according to the new regulations, uh, additional tier one needs to be able to absorb losses when the common equity ratio goes below five and an eighth percent. Uh, when the regulations were drafted, this was considered to be a high enough trigger for going concern loss absorption. Uh, but over time, as the capital requirements have evolved and more and more capital is required of the banking sector, uh, this has become a low trigger uh, that is very often considered to be below the point of non-viability. So the new trend is for many jurisdictions to create a framework within, within which banks are incentivized to issue uh, high trigger cocos. Not necessarily convertible, convertible into shares. In many cases, uh, cocos can absorb losses by writing down the principal amount. So the, the use of the, of the term COCO is a bit of a misnomer. What, what do you um, foresee supply of 81 deals being like uh, in Europe for the next six months to a year? Do you think there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, issuance? And if so, from, uh, from which types of banks, from which jurisdictions do you, ex do you expect to see supply? Right. Well, we're starting from a very low base. There has been very little issuance uh, over the past couple of years, mostly because the regulations that are needed to give banks uh, the confidence that they're issuing the correct types of structures uh, weren't there. Uh, the rules are now almost finalized. Uh, so yes, I, uh, I do expect uh, significantly more issuance uh, for the rest of this year and going forward. Uh, in terms of who would be the next issuer, before the BBVA transaction, I would have said uh, it ought to be a UK or Scandinavian bank. Uh, obviously, BBVA provides a very positive example uh, of a bank from a periphery jurisdiction able to access the market for a uh, structure with uh, a lot of uh, loss absorbing features. Uh, that said, I still believe that the next deal is most likely to come out of the UK or uh, Scandinavia. In the UK, uh, specifically the Financial Policy Committee has asked banks to raise uh, additional capital uh, of 25 billion pounds by the end of the year. Uh, a significant proportion of this ought to be in additional tier one uh, or additional tier one hosted cocos. One of the things that's defined the cocoa market um, is that the structures of the deals have been very different. They've had uh, different trigger points. Uh, some of them, as you mentioned, um, convert to equity, while others write down the principal and, and so forth. Um, some of them have also been very complex. The BBVA tr transaction, for example, had, um, depending on who you speak to, between four mm -hmm. and six uh, trigger points for conversion to uh, equity. Um, is that something that you think will last in the long term, or do you think the market needs to get to a point where there's a more universal structure? And what are the key things that investors are looking for when, when, they, um, uh, when they're uh, presented with COCOs? Right. Uh, I'll start by quoting my head of syndicate here. He often likes to say that investors don't like loss absorption. They're prepared to accept risks at a price. Uh, that said, I believe that a variety of structures will continue to be used. Uh, and uh, one message that I frequently hear from investors is that they don't like to see every possible investor unfriendly feature built into the same instrument. 
Uh, in the case of BBVA, for example, as you pointed out, uh, the trigger language uh, was very complex, uh, potentially aggressive, uh, but BBVA gave investors the most investor-friendly loss absorption mechanism possible under the rules. So far, issuance of cocoa seems to have been confined to uh, Western Europe mainly. Do you think there's a possibility of um, Eastern European banks, perhaps Russian banks, um, uh, issuing cocos in, in the near future? Market-wise, definitely. Some of these emerging market bank banks are actually um, among the, uh, the, the, the most favorite names uh, in the Asian retail market, which uh, for the time being is the, the single deepest uh, uh, pool of demand uh, for these instruments. Um, the question mark is whether they will have the same incentives in terms of the regulations uh, to issue high-trigger cocos. At the moment, there are very few jurisdictions outside of the EU that have embraced high-trigger cocos uh, as a way of imposing additional capital uh, requirements. Uh, for plain vanilla, Basel-free compliant instruments, definitely yes. Emil, thank you very much for that. Thank you.